Chapter 4. I could have taken the cab, but didn't trust being able to get out of it again. I only had to travel nine blocks. Walking at my present rate, I might have made it by Tuesday. At the bus stop in front of my building, I look left to the oncoming traffic of cars and vans, a limo and a cement truck. Far up 2nd Avenue rose the white crest of a bus route. I fished out a token and waited with it in my hand. I discovered her name, Gloria Manlow. She would have had to fill out an admission form for her dog at the vets, given some sort of address. I had to see it. Any chance of her showing up while I was there, I jinxed simply by wishing it would be that easy. A great white whale, the bus, veered to the curb and stopped abruptly. An M15 local to City Hall. Five other passengers seated on board. I rode standing, gripping a steel loop, reading an overhead advertisement for hemorrhoidal laser surgery and a Langston Hughes poem about loss, or what I thought it was about. I signaled my stop. The building numbers ascended evenly as I walked along the south side of 3rd Street, past two art galleries and a Jamaican music store. Most of the block was composed of gray stone and brick apartment buildings with dingy tiled entryways. Number 76 was located directly across the street from the NYC headquarters of Hell's Angels. Out front, six fat Harleys slouched in a row like soldiers at ease. No activity this early, not yet noon. I abandoned the idea of staking out the vets. It was a bad vicinity to aimlessly loiter, especially looking like I'd been in one fight already. It wasn't likely the girl would come for her dog that day anyway. Not if she was lying low, but you never know. From the outside, the animal hospital looked like a plant store, flowering window boxes and several tall ferns and planters chained to an ironwork fence. A hand-painted sign hung over the door, hours by appointment. The door was oak with a brass handle and six glass panels, a sticker on one, pets need dental care too. I pushed the bell and the latch clacked. I went in. The reception area had terracotta flooring and lacquered pine benches. Only one patient waiting, a lady with a plastic carry kennel, white whiskers peeking out its grill. I crossed over to the receptionist, touch typing on a curved ergo ergonomic keypad. After a solid minute, she looked up at me. She was a young, fresh-faced, strawberry blonde, solid forehead and a small, pink-painted mouth. Her bland expression made nothing of my bruised face. Maybe she'd seen worse. Working on the Lower East Side? I know that I have. Yes? Hi, I'm a friend of Gloria's. We spoke on the phone about Pike. Her blue eyes were neutral. Yes? I wasn't able to talk to her yet and was wondering if she called. She shook her head. The bell rang and she buzzed the door latch. It opened and a tall woman entered holding the taut leash of a slender gray husky with glacier green eyes. The dog sniffed at the carry kennel on the bench and the cage hopped to one side like a jumping bean. The tall woman yanked the dog leash saying, no, Nanette, no, good girl. I resumed my pitch to the receptionist. I think Gloria is strapped for cash right now, I told her, and she won't admit it. I don't want anything to happen to her dog meantime. I pulled out my wallet and looked inside, a creased 20 and a single. On the countertop, decals for three major credit cards. My Visa card doubtful, I slid over Discover. Could I get a look at her bill, see how much I can handle? She smiled at me. Now I was a customer. Her fingers clicked over the keyboard as she summoned the information to her screen. She said, usually we refer these kids over to the ASPCA or a clinic for minor problems, you know, spaying, neutering, shots, but her dog's leg was badly torn, 17 stitches. Little thing, too, 32 pounds. Oh, you don't have to lean. I, I'll print it up. How much do you want to pay on the 385 balance? I figure the cost and profit of information. $120? She typed in the amount and slid my card through a sensor. We waited a tense 90 seconds to see if it would clear. I heard the Jeopardy theme in my head. A receipt began to print out. I signed it and got back my plastic. She swiveled her chair over to the printer and rolled back again with two sheets. She handed them to me, then held on to a little tug. I didn't tug back. I met her steady gaze. Blue, blue eyes, even her whites, a Dresden china blue. Would you like to see him, she asked me. Who? Pike. He could stand the attention. 
Oh, yeah, sure. She let go of the papers in my hand. I didn't even look, just folded them and put them in my pocket and followed her around the counter to a rear door of glass and chicken wire mesh. As the door opened, an animal aroma hit me, hot, funky, sour, a discordant wail of woofs, morales, and clucking calls. The cement floor was tacky with antiseptic. The cages, about 20 in all, were built the length of both walls. Some were small enough for rabbits, a couple big enough to fit St. Bernard's. Located in a middle row, one down from a bug-eyed chihuahua in a neck brace, was Pike's medium-sized cage. Pike was sitting in a back corner amongst newspaper scraps, crouched in on himself, gargoyleish. He was all skin and muscle, a honey-colored pit bull with big white paws and a pink-white snout with gray whiskers made ridiculous by an off-white plastic cone, like an upside-down lampshade, around his neck to prevent him from biting his stitches. Hey, boy, I said. He rolled his eyes desolately his rat tail curled motionless around his hind legs. The receptionist silently watched me. Come here, Pike. Come here, boy. I lifted my hands to the bars and stopped. It was a pit bull. Hesitantly, I poked two bare fingers in. The dog rose on all legs and crossed in a side-to-side -side bound. His hot nose touched my hand and he sniffed long and hard at my skin comparing its scent against the private catalog of past offenders. Feeling his steamy breath, I had to hook my fingers on the cage to keep from yanking them out. His mouth cracked open in a slathering grin of crocodile teeth. His tongue lolled and licked my hand. Turning his head sideways, he brushed my fingers with a velvet soft and floppy ear. Obediently, I scratched him, saying, Good dog, good boy, Pike. I meant it. Does he get exercise, I asked? Some, but a dog like this, he used to, he's used to roaming around, doesn't understand being cooped up all day. Remind his owner of that when you see her. If I see her. She forgot her beeper at my place, and now I'm having trouble getting a hold of her. Oh? I stopped, scratching Pike, and he eyed me like, where are you going? I took out a notepad and wrote down my first name and phone number. I tore the page off and handed it to her. If you hear from her, I'd appreciate you giving me a call, I said, and if you don't, well... Call me before they do anything about Pike. I put my hands up to the bars and scratched again at both his ears. His plastic collar balked against the cage door. He looked like a Looney Tunes pup with his head stuck inside a funnel. I gotta go now, I told him. Gotta find your moms. I walked away, turned back. His brown eyes from behind bars were baffled and betrayed. I thanked the receptionist for her help. She handed me her business card, Roxanne Piatra. Medical secretary. I stood corrected. Thanks, Roxanne. She crinkled the skin around her eyes, then reached a hand up to my left temple. I almost shied away, but she only touched my forehead gently and smoothed down the curled up corner of the bandage over my eye. Something puzzled her. Her blue, blue eyes wondered it in mine until the phone rang and she had to answer that first. She said, well, good luck anyway, Peyton. A little unsettling. When you're a dweller in the woodwork by profession, it isn't always pleasant getting noticed. This was different, though. I got out of there, my ego still on hunger strike. Outside, I read over the billing information I paid $120 to get a look at. At first glimpse, not worth even half that. It itemized the cost of Pike surgery, anesthesia, and three days food and boarding. He'd been admitted Tuesday at 9 a.m., badly wounded, shards of glass removed. Sex, color, and markings were listed. 11 months old, a mixed breed pit bull and boxer. In the space for owner was Gloria's name, the 917 prefix number to her beeper, and an address farther east in Alphabet City, no apartment number. I crossed the street and headed east. Turning the corner of First Avenue, I almost bumped into a carrot top man in a black turtleneck, removing the padlocks on the gates of Little Ricky's Gift Emporium its windows crowded with tchotchkas, a buxom Betty Page wall clock, clock sharp-edged metal wind-up toys, 3D postcards of Jesus, a plaster head bust of Elvis, rubber crocodiles, and a stack of Ganesha lunchboxes. During a lull on traffic, I cut across the erratic five <coughs> lanes of First Avenue, but hobbling badly or too well, I took longer than the lull and had to dodge out of the way of a speeding FedEx truck. 
I stumbled over the curb and a nasty twinge crept up my right leg and sank in scissors deep into my lower back. I needed a cigarette or an aspirin or both. The address Gloria had given was 729 East 9th Street, six streets up and at least three avenues over, maybe four. Either way, I couldn't walk it, so I flagged a cab. When I asked the driver if I could smoke in his cab, he said no. I got in anyway. He raced up First Avenue and swung east on 6th Street, then sped past Avenues A and B, nearing C, or Bosaida Avenue. We entered a Latino barrio. Tenements, vacant lots, ignored by the city, then claimed by the residents for parking lots and community gardens. On the crumbling walls, giant murals of sports cars, superheroes, mythical beasts, unicorns, and the Minotaur, and a rainbow of spray paints. Slower going here, cars and pickups double parked. At Avenue D, we turned uptown. Ahead, on 14th Street, the brick stacks of the Con Edison Electric plant stood high like a row of dormant silos. To the right, over the FDR Drive and the crinkled lead surface of the East River was a neon domino sugar sign facing out from Brooklyn. The cabbie turned onto 9th Street. The north corner building was under construction. Blue scaffolding splotched with cement surrounded it. On the south side of the street was another project underway, courtesy of the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development. Four-story sandstone buildings, low-income housing that from the outside looked like one-room schoolhouses. Many of the new windows still had manufacturer names pasted on them. Some had already been smashed. Two hard-hatted workers pushing around wheelbarrows full of bricks eyed my cab suspiciously, or I'm paranoid. Farther along the street, the street was desolate. It seemed a waste of cab fare, not to mention the 120 when I got the approximate address. A line of fenced-in lots, one of which was a private parking area. The nearest actual building was a derelict five-story brownstone, brownstone surrounded on all sides by rubble. The fire-blackened entrance was boarded up. Its painted numerals 737 were barely visible. Where number 729 should have been was a chain-link fence enclosing a green garden with flowery, flowering paths, trees, and shrubs. I had the cabbie stop. Inside the garden, the man was using a broken-handled hoe to scoop peat moss from a 20-pound bag sitting inside a three-wheeled grocery cart. He spread it over sandy topsoil. He was viper-thin, dressed in loose denim from head to ankle a blue jean slouch hat pulled down low over long, gunky black silver hair and orange-tinted sunglasses. A black Fu Manchu mustache was pasted down his hollow cheeks like a cheap disguise. Because of his shades, I couldn't tell whether he saw me getting out of the cab or not, but he began tilling the earth farther down the lot, and by the time I crossed the pavement to the fence, he was at the door of a tool shed built against the rear wall of an abandoned building the next street over. I called out, but he shut the door behind him. The shack was constructed of scrap wood, cardboard, sections of billboard, and broken street signs like do not enter and one way. I tried the gate, padlock, a motorcycle chain coiled twice around. I gazed over the garden. Not often you got to admire nature in the city and strangely so far into its ruins. A gathering of daisies and a row of shrubs ran along a curving path paved with flagstones, slivers, and pot shards, and broken bricks squarely embedded in the earth. Peeking be from behind a variety of floor were chipped lawn sculptures of a Ukrainian eagle, a bearded gnome, and a blue-stained Madonna. I limped back to the cab and eased myself in. The cabbie's black-rimmed eyes studied me intently in the rectangular rearview mirror. Where to now, bud? I might have known the address would be a phony, a waste of my time and my money, well, my good credit. The spending of future funds, like I was bailing water into my sinking ship. Robo, life raft, whatever. The cab there and home again robbed me of eight more of my 21 remaining bucks. My resolve began to dissolve, now that my quest was starting to cost me. When I got in the apartment, the faxes for Mac, Matt were waiting for me in the tray and one new message on my answering machine. I lit up a cigarette and then played the message. 
I thought it'd be Matt checking that I got his fax, but it was someone who wanted to hire me, of all things. A Suffolk County attorney with a high, chuckly voice and too much divorce work on his hand, who said a satisfied customer had recommended me. I couldn't imagine. He left his number. I hated marital investigations, which is sort of like saying I hated paying the rent. I hated paying the rent. I overdid my limp and not getting back to the machine in time to save the message before it rewound. What did I want to work for anyway? I had a hobby, 